Hello, my name is Zachary Kush, and I just sacrificed the lion's share of my Septembrian leisure time to Starfield. So did I think it was good? Well, strap in and prepare to jump to light speed for this doozy of a video in order to find out. Let's ask, then answer the question. Starfield, is it good? Before we begin, it might be prudent for me to share with you my Bethesda backstory and my Bethesda bugbears. The former shall provide critical context which those of you who saw my Elden Ring video know is kind of a big deal to me, as well as an overview of the various problems I have historically leveraged against Bethesda's various games. So please, settle in for my Bethesda backstory. At the exact moment in which I am typing these words into a Google Doc, I have played three Bethesda games, Fallout 3, Skyrim, and Fallout 4. Fallout 3 came out in 2008. In 2008, I was a 14-year-old boy who had spent the majority of his preteen years playing Final Fantasy VII, Final Fantasy VIII, Final Fantasy X, and Chrono Trigger. Then, in 2008, I was hanging out with my friend John, who had rented a little game called Fallout 3. I recall friend John in the courtyard of the Galaxy News Radio building, sporting a red baseball cap, blaring 40s music over an in-game radio, and launching a tiny nuclear device at a big, raging monster. This was all the information I needed to know that this was the game for me. Fast forward to 2011, and I'm a high school senior when Skyrim comes out. Like many of you, I lost many an hour gallivanting around the world map, doing quests I don't remember, and knocking objects off of tables. Fast forward again to 2015, and I'm a college boy who had just spent eight months saving up money to buy his first ever PC, upon which I will spend 140 hours of a 168 hour week playing Fallout 4. My opinions on each of these three games are very similar, though it would take me two whole video essays to explain the minutia. For the purposes of this video presentation, which I promise you is still about Starfield, I shall present the following pithy opinion morsel. These games are masterclasses in open world design. The amount of hours of my life that I have put into just walking around in these games is staggering. I could have used that time to learn how to play the cello, or get a girl to fall in love with me. I know they all have fast travel, but I never use it. Though I will admit to employing the carts and utilizing the helicopter feature in Skyrim and Fallout 4, respectively. So strong is the world design in these games that it is enough to support the entire experience for me. Seriously, no other game studio makes worlds that I want to wander, as well as Bethesda. And it's a good thing too, because in terms of like narrative design and gameplay, Fallout 3, Skyrim, and Fallout 4, are mediocre at best, and buckets of trash at worst. So where in this trend fits Starfield? Is it a bold step towards a new golden era, a middling crawl through mediocrity, or a big crunch disappointment? I shall answer this question, dear viewer, with the following topical list. 1. Bug Thesda. In anticipation for this game, as well as hoping to redeem myself for my 30 frames per second Elden Ring video, I purchased an AMD Radeon RX 6800 XT graphics card as recommended by the game's Steam store page. Three days into my playing experience, the game murdered my CPU, so I purchased an Intel i5 10600K central processor as recommended by the game's store page. And wow, I know Bethesda games are notorious for their bugginess? especially at launch, but does this game chug like an insecure freshman at baby's first fraternity party? Aside from the usual stock of stutters, animation glitches, and the game quietly crashing behind loading screens when it didn't just flat out crash, my favorite recurring glitch reared its ugly head whenever I endeavored to talk to an NPC. Upon initiating the conversation, the game would usually throw up in its mouth before the avatar would stare at me blankly as words echoed from the heavens. The NPC then would silently mouth those words before the conversation could continue. You feel it a bit, can't you? Ever since I found the second one, I'll at the visions, really stuff, being around them is just well. comforting. So hey, I I'm still not a hundred percent. And this was happening with literally every NPC I spoke to and with the game's recommended hardware. On the bright side, I can now run Elden Ring and Death Stranding at a silky smooth 60 frames per second, and I can get the Final Fantasy VII Remake to 90, which is great 
because those are all games I'd rather be playing. Seriously, this game is a buggy nightmare and desperately needs a carpet bomb of patches to make it stable. This has been a consistent problem with Bethesda games at launch and it only seems to be getting worse. At least I can run Fallout 4 at a constant frame right now, even with all my mods. So perhaps Starfield shall sustain such stability 10 years hence. Number 2. Spaceship. Much as I suspect many of you from the primordial emergence of consciousness, I have yearned for my own spaceship. More specifically, I've wished for a spaceship that was also my house. From the Millennium Falcon to building spiritual successors to Millennium Falcon out of Legos, to the Ebon Hawk, to the Normandy, to the other Normandy, to FTL, to the Unreliable, I have dreamed of possessing a spaceship, flying that spaceship around in space courier missions and inviting a variety of buds to hang out with me on my spaceship where they sit in chairs looking like they're doing something important or they just stand around with their arms folded because they're doing that on a spaceship. I am pleased to report that no game has scratched my spaceship itch quite in the way that Starfield has. Indeed, something in me foretells that Starfield will soon become the spaceship game, in which a prospective player eschews traditional questing exclusively for spaceship man spaceship exploits, much in the same way that Fallout 4 has become Fallout the Settlement Builder. But we'll have to wait for the game to be more stable and for modders to make the mode more interesting before it can really take off. 3. A bucket of stuff you can pick up. Someday soon, I'm going to produce labyrinthine video essays on both Fallout 3 and Fallout 4, in which I praise the exact same things in those games which I'm about to criticize in Starfield. So let me curb any preemptive accusations of hypocrisy by providing the following apologia. I like the scavenging and inventory management system in Fallout, though I dislike that very same inventory management system in both Skyrim and Starfield, and Incidentally, every other game of this genre. How could that be? Well, the Fallout games take place in the post-apocalypse, where nary a mason nor architect has been born in 200 years. People live in trash, and they build their homes out of trash. The most reliable food source available are two century-old packs of junk food. You can't even walk down to the Potomac to enjoy the setting sun over the water without a band of vaguely sapient ruffians appearing intent on your murder. You have to fight tooth and nail for every advantage. Modern Fallout is at its most interesting when you're scrambling, when you're frantically picking up enough trash to sell to a dispassionate chem vendor so you can afford a stim pack, when you're scrounging the bodies of the dead under fire because your gun broke or ran out of ammo when you're running crippled through a metro tunnel, duck into a bathroom, and desperately drink water out of the toilet because you need health now and you can deal with the radiation damage later. This works doubly so for Fallout 4, where you need that trash you find to surround your settlements with walls, and I sure do love building walls, as well as upgrading your weapons. It makes contextual sense within this world and supports the fight, loot, return gameplay loop which sustains these games. I find it genuinely interesting whenever I'm planning on setting out from my house in Megaton or my home base base and sanctuary, and I'm debating how many supplies I should bring, because I'll need that inventory space to haul back that sweet, sweet loot. And the world space is conducive to these activities, as the Fallout world takes place in the Corpse of America. As you're poking around, you're coming across terminal entries, audio logs, and environmental details, which tell you about the world which caused the apocalypse. A world where people worry about things that don't matter anymore drop proper nouns like China and communism, which have meaning to us in the real world but are rendered meaningless in this world, and our world could all too easily become this world. All these systems work together to reinforce Fallout's themes. The world space, traversal mechanics, and inventory management each represent the waste that the Great Nuclear War represents. In Fallout, your forebears destroyed the world over petty, insulated worries, and now you're left to pick up the pieces. It's great. These systems still exist in Starfield, and yet they don't work for me because they're not supporting anything. Wandering around Starfield's samey fields and samey Mars-based planetary settlements has made me realize that so much of Fallout's greatness is to 
derived from its setting. The absence of exploratory interest staggers me, as without it I realize how much of the universe is dead empty space. I love reading about the old world of the Fallout setting, but I also must accept that those games have the benefit of having real life write much of their world lore. When Bethesda must design a world without the assistance of real life, they fail to capture me. Maybe it's because The Elder Scrolls feels like a store brand Lord of the Rings-esque high fantasy nestled into a less interesting Greek mythology, or maybe it's because Starfield feels like a theme park of stock space-age tropes. But these worlds in particular don't really grab me because they aren't greater than the sum of their parts. I feel the Lord of the Rings, the Wheel of Time, and the Norse mythology influence in Skyrim, but nothing which makes it feel distinctively idiosyncratically, unseparatedly Skyrim. Just as I feel the alien, the Martian, and most saliently, the No Man's Sky influence bleeding all over Starfield, there's nothing I can point to and say that's definitively Starfield. I call it the goodbye proxy problem. To demonstrate, there is a random shot in the failed horror film Event Horizon, where a torrent of blood spills down a spaceship hallway in a clear homage to the classical cult horror film The Shining. In The Shining, this shot makes contextual internal sense. It exists as part of the film's mission statement. It is a vision Danny is experiencing, contextualized by all the other wacky stuff he's seen and now the audience is seeing, and it fits with the surrealist abstract horror that the movie is going for. In Event Horizon, this shot exists because it was in The Shining, and The Shining was good. And hey, if we put some stuff from The Shining into our horror movie, then our horror movie will also be good. Good by proxy if you will. Starfield is a game world built entirely out of this problem. And while this problem does exist somewhat in Bethesda Fallout games, that series has strong enough themes and aesthetics that it can make such moments feel like Fallout. Fallout feels like itself because all of its elements are united behind a narrative, thematic, and demonstrative purpose. Starfield doesn't feel like anything because all of its elements are sealed away in different boxes which don't interact with each other in any interesting ways. Speaking of boxes, four. A toy box of nothing. Aside from their big, meticulously designed open worlds, Bethesda games tend to offer a wide variety of activities with which a prospective player may occupy themselves. There's exploration, main questing, side questing, inventory management, resource collection, unique item and ability collection, NPC companions to collect, manage, and complete quests for, collectibles scattered across the world, and crafting of the weapons, potions, settlements, spaceships, and settlements again variety. Starfield, true to this design philosophy, likewise offers its purchasers with a toy box of time sinks with which one can occupy oneself. And if mere occupation of one's self is all one is after, then Starfield's myriad of distractions will surely satiate. But if one seeks a more meaningful holistic experience, then one shall find Starfield to be little more than a toy box of nothing. YouTube daddy Joseph Anderson once made a video on Fallout 4 which highlights how its gameplay loop of exploration, combat, and gathering is rather functional and even pleasant, and how these systems all interact in such a way as to elevate the game experience. Piggybacking off this point, Fallout 4 also offers a wide variety of companions, factions, main questing, and side questing, which all feel vestigial and hollow, precisely because they lack this interconnectedness. Exploring, fighting enemies, looting the area, returning to a settlement to drop off the loot, then using the loot to upgrade weapons, armor, and settlement structures, then going off to explore and find some more materials materials is a fun interconnectedness of systems which has compelled me to sink 1500 hours into Fallout 4, and it's made further enjoyable by the fact that it has broader thematic purposes. Fallout 4 is a broken world which I am aiming to repair vis-a-vis -vis the game's systems. It feels good to take my trashed suburban neighborhood and revive it. It feels good to meet strangers in the world and provide them with a new home and a fresh start, and it's a feeling I gift to myself through the act of engaging with the game's systems. Starfield systems, and indeed many of the other systems within Fallout 4, lack this interconnectedness. Rather than flowing from one activity to another in an organic, meaningful way, one instead picks up one toy, be it questing, exploration, or spaceship building, and plays with that for a while until it grates. Then you discard it for the next toy. And then there's this weird artificiality on display when, say, you do the main quest for a while, get bored, then switch to another activity. The main quest will just sit there on pause until you feel like picking it up again. It 
saddens me because there's clearly a lot of work and care on display in Starfield and yet it's all for naught as it doesn't support anything grander or more meaningful. In Fallout New Vegas, all the side questing and companion interactions provide the player with a broader context regarding the major factions, all vying for Hoover Dam, as well as the smaller factions which could help or hinder them. In Elden Ring, all the scavenging, inventory management, and weapon upgrading serve to give you an edge in the game's harsh world, as well as providing permanent progress, reinforcing the game's central themes of perseverance and success against overwhelming odds. In Death Stranding, unlocking and producing equipment, as well as utilizing resources to construct infrastructure, streamlines the courier process and allows you to better navigate the world space to deliver your parcels. In in Final Fantasy VII Remake, leveling up, finding and upgrading both your materia and equipment, and garnering rewards from smaller, more insular side quests and arenas helps you progress the story, provides you with a unique opportunity to express characterization vis-a-vis -vis materia loadouts, and allows you to explore, hang out in, and understand more about the fictional world. All of these games' systems hold up bigger ideas. In Starfields, there's just like a bunch of stuff that you can do. There are many different systems and activities one can engage in, but they don't prop up an interesting story or provide you with unique solutions to narrative questions or even let you learn about the in-game world in any interesting way. You just kind of quest until you're tired of doing that, then you build your ship for a while until you're tired of doing that, then you fly around the galaxy until you're tired of doing that, then you chat up your robotic crewmates until you're tired of doing that. There's no fluidity or sense of greater purpose. It's just a box of separate toys you can pick up and then put down again. I guess that's better than nothing, but why spend all of this time and do all of this work just to make something that's better than nothing? In essence, to be good enough as to be preferable to boredom, yet not good enough to elicit any further emotionality or reflection, is the very definition of mediocre. 5. The Megaton Problem In Fallout 3, the first wasteland settlement the player is encouraged to visit is the town of Megaton, a walled-off community built around an undetonated atomic bomb. I bring this up because there are two quests in this zone which illustrate both the potential and the recurring problem in Bethesda game quest design. The first of these is the quest following in his footsteps, which tasks the player with searching for information regarding their vagrant father. Investigations into Megaton direct us to local sleazeball pub owner Colin Moriarty. Moriarty already possesses the information we seek but withholds it from us for the sake of profit. We are then given several avenues with which to obtain this information. We can pay Moriarty, run a little errand for him, hack into his computer when he's not looking, for which we can either rely on our pickpocket skills or murder Moriarty for the password. There are even other little touches to this quest as you can sweet talk Moriarty's overworked staff for hints regarding the terminal, and if you run Moriarty's errand to recover money from Silver, you can murder her, sweet talk her into giving you the money, or speech check her into giving you more money than Moriarty asked for, thus making a tidy little profit by exploiting another's desperation, just like Moriarty is doing to you. Or you can refuse Moriarty's offer and search for your father in another way, perhaps taking the hint of Galaxy News Radio, which the game has so generously offered you. All in all, this is good RPG quest design. Your character is motivated to find information on their father, and you're given a source of that information and then offered various means to secure that information vis-a-vis -vis the game's mechanics. And it's through these mechanics that you characterize your character. What kind of person are you? Do you just cough up the money? Do you sneak behind Moriarty's back, justifying the theft with the fact that he's a bad person? It's your first instinct to chat up the people around you and search for additional information and additional options? Or do you do the dirty? Or do you say to hell with it and walk away? These are the kinds of quests I play RPGs for. I want to express character motive and characterization through game mechanics. Unfortunately, this is the exception rather than the rule in Bethesda games. Most Bethesda quests are like the power of the atom in which the player is offered a choice. They can either disarm the atomic bomb in the town's center, or they can blow up the town and kill all of its inhabitants. This scenario, of course, elicits several questions. Why do they build a town by an undetonated atomic bomb? Why are they trusting some teenager they've never met to mess with it? Why would you want to blow up this town? Why would the people who want you to blow up this town hire some random teenager they've never met to do it? Why would I, a fresh-faced idiot teenager, mess with an atomic bomb? How would I even know what I'm doing? Did I 
learn about this in disarming atomic bomb class? The situation is ridiculous. It does, however, come to make sense when you realize that this quest wasn't designed to further the story of the player character in the way that following in his footsteps did. This quest exists to give the player something to do and to offer the player the in-game rewards of spectacle and a home base. The fact that the majority of Bethesda's quests are designed around giving the player something to do, rather than offering opportunities to develop and define the player character, is the source of much of their games' shallowness and vapidity. In Skyrim, for example, with the possible exception of whether or not you decide to murder Parthernax, and yes, I do pronounce it Parthernax, because it's got two A's after the P and before the Earth. That's an elongated A. It's not Parthenax, it's Parthenax. All of the quests are centered around giving the player something to do. So much so that the world space becomes little more than a theme park you run around in, visiting all of the attractions and uh, killing people. Cause you, they, you make funny ragdolls when you kill them. A fatal flaw in Fallout 4, by contrast, is the notable dissonance between character and player motivation. The character wants to find their son, but the player wants to roam around the wasteland and build settlements. So much so that many eschew the main quest exclusively for these other systems. So is the Megaton problem in Starfield? Well, let me tell you a story. Early in the game, whilst running errands for the group of idiots who had employed me simply because I touched a rock and experienced a DMT dream sequence, I opted to complete a simple delivery job both for the sake of in-game currency and for the sake of vicariously satisfying my unobtainable desire to be a space courier who lives full-time in a spaceship. Upon beaming into the system in which I could complete my delivery, I was contacted via the space phone to visit some security chief. My investigations led me to a nearby spacecraft, where upon boarding, I was roped into playing diplomat for a stranded band of prospective colonists who entrusted me, a man they've never met, and indeed the first human they've ever seen who had not been born on their ship to be their diplomat. After staggering around their ship, which various idle dialogue informed me was both outdated and outclassed, despite the fact that it didn't look any different from any of the other locales I had visited, a quick glance at the mission log revealed to me that the security officer was not aboard this ship, but was rather down on the planet. So I popped down to the planet to chat with him. After threatening me several times, he revealed to me that he likewise planned to recruit me as a diplomat for zero compensation. And upon discovering that I had already visited the ship in question, directed me to speak with his Australian boss. He then exited the conversation without telling me where his boss was or anything about him. Evidently, he knew that I was a player character and that my quest log would be all the direction I needed. Once I staggered my way into the corporate headquarters, I sat in on a meeting with three resort executives, who provided me with three options. One, I could inform the colonists that they could settle the world if they agreed to be these three people's footstools. Two, I could, from my own finances, purchase a warp drive for the colonists so that they might fly elsewhere. Though, why would I do that? I don't know any of these people, and a warp drive sounds really expensive. Or three, I could just find a way to murder the colony ship. Seeing as none of this was really my problem, and I'm not the sort of guy to just murder an entire ship of what purport to be living, breathing citizens, just to satisfy some corpo's bottom line. So I instead flew back to the colonist ship, hoping for some kind of option where I could say, hey, these guys, they're just a bunch of greedy suits. Just attack them and take over. But instead, the captain of the vessel readily agreed to enslave herself and everyone on board her ship. Then, with the corporals requesting some kind of materials with which to further build their infrastructure as to accommodate their new slaves, the acquisition of these materials somehow became my responsibility. So I sweet talked the captain into giving me what materials they could spare. Then I jumped into my ship and I flew away, never to return. I assess that. This venture is adequate to illustrate the fundamental problem I have with Bethesda quest design, especially how it exists in Starfield. On paper, this quest is intriguing and endemic to the setting. What would a planetary settlement do if a spaceship of colonists showed up hoping to settle their world? It's an interesting situation, let down by the vapidness of how it's handled. With this quest, Bethesda isn't trying to develop their setting or express a theme or even allow us the chance to express something about our character. It is instead 
there to give us, the player, something to do. We, the player, are tasked with playing Diplomat because someone at Bethesda heard that players like doing things like that. We're giving three choices on how to resolve the conflict because Bethesda heard that players like making choices in games. And the more choices we get to make, the better the game. And finally, it's on us to accumulate the funds or materials needed to complete the quest because this is a game. And players like to accumulate money and or materials and then spend those materials in the game space. So yes, the Megaton problem is alive and well in Starfield. Well, maybe this isn't a problem for you. Maybe all you want is a theme park where you run around building a ship and doing busy work for NPCs, killing people, collecting and spending money, collecting and spending resources and acquiring levels. Then I ask you, why do they even have NPCs at all? Why build a world? Why try and make a story? Why not just strip away the veneer of an RPG? and be more like Destiny. Well, they did once before. They made Fallout 76, which they marketed as a theme park which eschews all the trappings of a story-based RPG in favor of a purely mechanical experience wherein you run around a Fallout world shooting ghouls, looting resources, and discovering locations. Except nobody liked that game. Granted, that game had a myriad of technical problems, but they did feel the need to shove NPCs and the semblance of a story back into it later. Not to mention, you'd be hard-pressed to find a Fallout fan who doesn't regard Fallout New Vegas as superior to both Fallouts 3 and 4. And Fallout New Vegas is a game all about developing your player character. It's a shame that Starfield is not. Number six, a universe of menus. As I stated earlier, Bethesda's unparalleled skill at designing traversable, explorable worlds is the main appeal of their games for me. And they are so unparalleledly skilled at such things that I am willing to stomach their games is myriad of other recurring problems. Starfield, however, takes place in space, and space is a difficult place to render into a traversable world. So instead, in Starfield, you navigate the world with menus. To travel, say, from the Lodge to Mars, you have to stagger through the city of New Atlantis to your spaceship, sit down at the pilot seat, trigger the takeoff animation, then navigate to the star map in the menu, select the system you want to go to, watch the traversal animation, arrive at the system, navigate to the menu again, select the planet, select the part of the planet you want to land your ship upon, watch the landing animation, then select exit ship. And you have to do this every time you want to go to a new planet. In your space exploration game, that's about going to new planets. And this is the setting necessitating solution for which Bethesda sacrificed literally the only thing you can call consistently good in their games. Was it worth it? It certainly wasn't. Number seven. I don't care about any of these people. I see. Over the past 15 years and across three games, Bethesda has managed to make me care about three characters. Daddy Liam Neeson, Parthernax, and the vault Salesman. And before you go trying to accuse me of some kind of character prude snobbery, let me tell you that I will go out of my way to care about a character. I'm literally the only guy in the world, besides YouTube's own Inhaling Ashes 26 who genuinely likes Mikolash and the Mikolash boss fight in Bloodborne. The reason I like these characters is to derived mainly from their role in the setting. They have goals and motivations which make sense within the broader context of their respective worlds, and your interactions with them develop the setting they're involved in. Daddy Liam Neeson is a scientist who wanted to purify the water around DC, a noble goal and one endemic to the Fallout setting, wherein various plots often revolve around resource management and acquisition, but he abandoned this goal in order to secure a safe place to live for you, his child. Eventually, however, his old dream catches up with him and he returns to the wasteland, setting off the main story. Arthurnax complicates the simplistic evil of the dragons you've been munching on and even encourages an opportunity for reflection. Interacting with Parthernax actually develops on Skyrim's story and makes their iteration of fantasy dragons more interesting and unique. Too bad this plot doesn't really go anywhere. And finally, we have the vault salesman, who we meet at the the start of Fallout 4. We then witness his performative chipperness melt into stark fear, transform alongside his body into despair, which we can then mitigate by inviting him to live in one of our settlements. Should we do so, he expresses genuine happiness. You know what? Since we talked, I'm feeling swell. Wow, that made me feel an emotion. 
Gold star, Todd. Unfortunately, most Bethesda characters don't get to make narrative choices, develop the setting in central conflict, or even go on little emotional journeys like these characters. Most Bethesda characters are pure function. The Megaton problem extends to the people who inhabit these fictional worlds. They have no life or personality beyond their role as companions, shopkeepers, enemies, or exposition dispensers. Most, if they have any personality at all, have one note personality. And even the dullest of music appreciators know that a song needs at least two notes to be interesting. I did earnestly try to engage with Starfield's stiff, robotic denizens in my eternal quest to feel emotions before I am rendered a corpse. But their stark artificiality grated me into dirt dust. Eventually, with my sincerest attempts exhausted and yet my mammalian instinctual drive towards companionship forever present within the abyss of myself, I opted to abandon in-game human contact exclusively in favor of the walking Mars rover robot. For at least, said I, this robot's roboticisms make contextual sense. So, if this game doesn't have good world design, and it doesn't have good quest design, and it doesn't have good character design, then what does it have? It's got cool jackets! Number 8 cool jackets. If there's one thing I like to do in video games, it's dress up my lumpy avatar. And I am not being sarcastic when I say I would definitely wear all of these jackets and all of these jumpsuits. Hey, shout me out in the comments section if you know where I can get this hat and where I can get this jacket, preferably without killing anybody. I mean, I do not recognize the humanity in any of these stiff-faced NPCs, but that doesn't mean I want to murder all of them. Besides, if Starfield's eventual fate is to become the space trucker game where you ignore all the story and focus on living your dream of being an itinerant space wanderer who pilots his house among the stars, then I might as well look the part. Well, that's all I got. As always, I have been and will continue to be Zachary Kush, and you just found out what I think about Starfield. Do I think it's good? Well, to recap, no, I don't think it's very good at all. I'm sorry, Todd. I'm sorry it only took me 20 hours to decide I didn't like the game you spent 8 years of your life making. Better luck next time, buddy. And hey, if you need a script doctor, my fees are reasonable. See ya, Space Cowboy. Hey, what are you doing? Hey, save that for the bad guys. I'm not gonna be part of this.